Hi, welcome. Come on in. Let me just put the kettle on and we can relax into a conversation on all the things that sing to our heart. As we head into the anniversary of the attacks on September 11th, 2001, and as we head into two personal anniversaries for myself, one is the month that I officially began sitting down and writing my book, The Song of the Human Heart, Dawn of the Dark Feminine in Islam, which is uh, the first part of three books. Uh, the draft after a year, almost seven months actually, of working on it was a thousand pages. And so I'm breaking it up into three different books. And the first book was, uh, the first third of the book was started on uh, about a year ago today, or this month at least. And then the other anniversary is uh, another year around the sun, you know, as they say, uh, another birthday coming up. And so I wanted to offer a sharing, offer a gift, and I wanted to read the introduction to the Song of the Human Heart and offer that to you for your, hopefully, your listening pleasure. So the book starts out with a story, a very short story, and I will save that for another day, um, but you're welcome to read it yourself. The book is available on Amazon. It's available on my website as well. But to dig right into the introduction, which is more relevant to, you know, really the question of what's going on with uh, Islamist extremism, what's going on with Islam, you know, we've, we have a very short scope. We've kind of forgotten that, uh, you know, while there are multiple realities in the world, while there's so many different things going on, and you know, honestly, everything deserves our attention, but our bandwidth is only so much. And as a country, we've shifted our focus in recent years to, you know, to domestic issues, and then a few, a few issues here and there around the world. But the issue of Islamist extremism, this issue of Islam, that's largely forgotten, and I, and I don't think it's something that uh, deserves to be forgotten. I also think it's something that deserves more curiosity, uh, more creativity, and and I and more of um, I, I suppose more of more patience. And so, the introduction here that, I'm, that I'll read to you in a second is is part a practice of patience. And you know, I'll dive right in, and you can see it for yourself. Introduction to the Song of the Human Heart Nearly two decades ago, the first version of this book went into a bidding war with three publishers, then represented by British literary agent David Bolt of David Bolt Associates. May his memory be a blessing. Bolt took a very rough first draft and quickly sourced a trio of interested publishers. It was around 2004, and the market, in the early years after the terror attacks of September 11th, 2001, was hungry for stories of Muslim women. However, the stories that most held the public's fascination was of sad Muslim women singing the song of woe. I didn't feel comfortable having a conversation about my story of woe when I didn't really know what Islam was. I mean, I had, at that point, woe. I mean, it at least some aspect of woe, um, but I didn't have the other part of that story, which is, which is Islam. And so having a story that's just an expression of your woe and projecting it onto an entire faith is damaging. And I didn't want to, didn't want to do that. How can I tell any kind of personal story within such a vast container as religion without being versed in that religion? This is common. Most people branded into religion at birth tend to not know much about the workings of that religion. 
Much like how most people who covet a brand of clothing or accessories proudly wear that product without knowing the business, the sustainability, or the ethics behind the label. And more importantly, it's not a label that they created. It's not a label that they partook in in any, any way other than just putting it on and acting like it somehow represents them. Religion is no different. The label doesn't diffuse the essence of the faith. No more than a piece of paper can create a marriage or cultivate a sense of relationship with a country through citizenship or a garment can uh, in any way embody the, you know, the label that it supposedly holds. Bolt shared that bidding wars in the publishing world were a rarity and that while there was an interest in the first manuscript, each publisher asked that I speak more of myself in the book. They wanted more immersion into the wound, more wading through pools of reflection. The advice was good, but there was a problem. The first version of this book was quite terrible. I was trying to speak to the questions I had about Islam, but the story was far from a work that deserved any kind of warring over. The work was a short sort of um, first scratch at my identity. I wrote about my frustrations, my wounds, my grief, my curiosity about this label. I was born into the label Muslim. And what you hear in the background is uh, one type of blackbird. And the limitations of that song, that first sort of squawking that a baby bird does, was very much like where I was at at that point. And it's just serendipitous that this is the track that's playing at this moment. So you get an idea through bird song of where where I was at at this point in life, you know, so despite the fact that uh, at that time a lot of attentions are growing into the idea of, of Muslim reform, though there wasn't officially a label of Muslim reform yet, and as the years progressed there was a lot of attention towards, oh, here's a Muslim woman, here's her voice. It wasn't as eloquent as it was made to, as, as it was, it was made to be as it was packaged. It was more of kind of like what you hear in the background right now. A baby bird squawking out into the open, not really knowing how to wield its voice, not even knowing that it has a song. There's something else that happens in the telling of your story, especially in the early years after the attacks of September 11th. The average inquiry into Islam and Muslims rose by about 400% in the years ahead. Then as now, Anyone who spoke on Islam would be framed as representative of that group of people, or worse, as an expert. I could barely represent myself at that point. At 20-something, I knew very little about the world or my place in it, though I had enough wisdom to know, I still held a lack of awareness, an ignorance that if acted upon, would do more harm than good in ways I couldn't possibly have full foresight about. And I think that's really important to sort of pause here for a minute and look at where we are now. What is it, 20 years later? 20 years later, we have a culture now in the United States where, you know, 20 something year olds with really no life experience, no personal cultivation of their own sense of self are projected onto national platforms because um, they have some sort of grievance or wound that, if aired, benefits a group of people um, for an agenda. And so you've got now a culture where you're rewarded for essentially being a child. And people are rewarded for being children, essentially, for for leading like children, for fighting like children, for for um, you know, for presenting that complex, you know, um, unevaluated, you know, whatever. You know, you get the idea. There was already so much of that out there. The events around 9-11 were a demonstration of what happens when wounds are simply aired but not allowed to heal, not given space and time to be understood. 
All I had then were fresh wounds and a string of personal and professional failures. And the fresh wounds I speak of are the challenges I faced as um, a young Muslim woman in a family who had essentially, you know, started questioning her faith and not out of a, um, a space of combativeness or malevolence, just, I just had questions, you know, and, and they weren't well received. They were, um, they made people uncomfortable. I had just quit a law school that I had worked very hard to get into. To the horror of my conservative Muslim family, I had quit law school with no backup plan. My entire heart was teetering and tottering at the edge of a rabbit hole called faith. When 9-11 happened, I had just started my senior year of college. And one question about religion after the fall of the Twin Towers led to another and then another. And it's, you know, and I, I guess in hindsight, I could say that the Twin Towers falling was in a lot of ways um, an alchemical process, you know, hindsight of, of being where I am now. It, it was an alchemical process because the same thing started happening in our personal lives. You know, we had, Muslim or not, we had, well, especially if you're a Muslim, you had, um, these monoliths that you thought represented the landscape of your being starting to sort of fall, you know, one after the other. And in a lot of cases, it was like a domino effect. The other side of my world was an increasingly rocky relationship with my family who felt their identity threatened by my questions about Islam. Equally, they were not entirely comfortable with their own star nerd daughter fast becoming a delinquent and a bohemian. I was unemployed on the tender hooks of homelessness as a result of family squabbles and um, unemployment. I didn't know what I would do with the rest of my life after having quit law school. Within the first year of law school, my questions on faith were growing into an unignorable presence in my life that overshadowed stories of court cases and legal codes that I was spending my day and night studying. I didn't belong in school. Amidst all that, a book deal would have been a triumph. Like the many other times in life to come, I sabotaged what seemed like a win by throwing the entire first draft in the bin or in the trash. The first version of this book didn't just need some more edits that told more of a story or more of my story. It needed to find the story worth telling. You find that story by listening patiently for as long as it takes. The story here isn't a book deal. The story here is that even in the infancy of our being, there is a song that calls to us. There is a song that called to me, though I didn't yet know its name, even though I couldn't yet hold its hum. Something all the while was speaking to me in a language I didn't yet understand. In a language beyond words, through the years that followed, I was given up, given, given pieces of the song. Other pieces I remembered as notes long held but forgotten or unseen, lost in the belief that life is a series of mundane moments when in truth it is thick with the sacred and asking to be scooped up with one finger, like the child who will always swipe across the frosting on a cake. Over the years, or over the next few years, while holding odd jobs and half careers that would give me the skills I later needed, I spent my time exploring. I moved in the dark, stumbling across a landscape that held no marks, that had no path. Years later, the word Muslim reformer rose to the surface, but it was always a temporary placeholder for me. It's still a reference point at best. It's not an identity in any sort of sense. Muslim reform is the slow rising but steady collective of Muslim Muslims across all walks of life, sex, gender, ethnicities, and nationalities who call for a re-examining and deconstruction of religion. While for years I accepted the title of Muslim reformer, I defined my personal approach to religious reform as when love for holy God surpasses the love for holy books or holy men. Most Muslim reformers have their own unique approach or flavor, just like any artist does. This work, this question of faith in its highest altruistic expression, is art.
or at least, in my opinion, it is best positioned through a pairing of art and inquiry versus simply a strict political, social, academic, or theological lens. Religious inquiry is enriched by creative spiritual expression. Like Islam, there is no singular movement or practice that encapsulates the diversity of waves of movement across the landscape of faith. There are Muslim reformers who are physicians, mothers, journalists, activists, scholars, theologians, housewives, and more. I've sat in on some Islamic theology classes whose students were brilliant aspiring academics who were largely unknown housewives during the day. Um, people you'll never know of and they have no interest in being in that public space but doesn't mean that there isn't something that's being you know investigated or dug into deeper below the surface i've befriended theologians who were greater women's rights advocates doing the heavy lifting of changing how we see faith doing more with a velvet touch than activists who demanded change with an iron fist one is not necessarily better than the other as each approach has a time and a place it's simply to say that there are so many people under the umbrella of humanity who want need whose lives depend on a radical realignment of what it means to be a devotee of god under islam what it means to believe in the divine power of an almighty god and the importance of their freedom of choice and inquiry at any step of the way. What has been building in the quote-unquote Muslim world is more than just reform, more than just revolution or re-evolution, another phase in the evolutionary cycle that is present in all life. Years later, I would leave the label Muslim reformer and move towards something beyond inherited identity, but I didn't know what just yet. I didn't know what came after, but I felt the shadow of a greater presence beyond the container of an ideology, which is all any religion is without authenticity and faith. The unmooring from a fixed identity, a fixed point of reference, is not easily done, especially when you don't know what you're sailing toward. How do you move toward something you can't see, toward God? How do you move toward knowing something you've been told not to question? It is one thing to begin to unlock the parts of your mind that have been held in the prison of, an, of inherited belief systems. It's another thing entirely when your whole life begins to shift like a tectonic plates grazing like great behemoths into a new form in cooperation with other parts of your life. Tectonic plates grazing like great behemoths into a new form. When moving toward the nameless, you start with something you can name. You start with naming your small little world as you know it. You start with examining every piece, including all the pieces that make you up without attachment to what you discover. This takes tremendous practice, but the dark night of the soul, which I cover in the second part of this series, is a gift that makes doing this easier. It becomes easier because to survive the dark night, you have to begin questioning every assumption as if your whole life was a murder mystery and this thing that was killed was you. You go back and retrace the steps, examining every angle, narrowing down the field of suspects along with their motivations. The naming becomes a placeholder, a pin on the map, a reference point, and nothing more. I started by naming everything that was broken around me and years later moved toward what was broken in me. This is the wound story I think our trio publishers wanted, but I didn't know how to tell this story yet. I couldn't tell a story that I hadn't even begun to fully live yet. When the idea for this book first came together, I had recently graduated from the University of California, Irvine, UCI. A degree from their humanities department gave me a solid start in learning how to ask questions of the outside world. Ultimately, there is no degree you can earn that tells you how to dismantle broken belief systems. There is no career path for a destroyer of worlds. There is no job listing for heresy. 
And what further education can you take at the peak of your step into the broader world when that world doesn't know how quickly it's all about to shift? At the start of my story, there was no map laid out that had any kind of territory that could draw a portrait of the complexity of the quest, especially not at the start of the digitized age. The absence of a map would become a significant theme in my life. The absence of a map offered freedom, allowing me to wander and linger on the question of Islam. The art of wandering is a skill I would need to develop when surveying the landscape and a skill I learned early on in life through constant waves of migration from Pakistan to Iran to Germany to the United States, then later Japan before emerging in the landscape of a budding inner world. In the landscape of faith, I found parallel realities as I describe in the series of songbooks this magnum opus is being parceled into. The Song of the Human Heart is the first of several books on Islam and our current crisis of civilization through the lens of the dark feminine. The dark feminine is the unapologetic mystery of the feminine aspect of God, sometimes to be referred to as the mystery through or though the two are similar but not exactly the same. There was one consistency in the path I was on, the longing to know something truer. In that longing, so many of us feel like the wanderer or the stranger who holds the lament of not belonging. The song of sorrow that sparked the interest of publishers was more than just a series of wounds and conflicts within the label of Islam. The song was an elegy, not yet complete because I had not yet completely died. Parts of my identity were dying, burning off, but a full death was still years away. When all you see in your faith and the culture it created is a remnant of what carries the energy of the curse, which is something I discuss in the first, or two, first chapter or two, you naturally think that the curse is the thing. In the language of fairy tales, the prince is the frog. Mm, the princess, you know, is or isn't a princess. The old peasant woman isn't a masterful queen. Uh, in folklore, until you become intimate with the life behind the illusion, all you see is the illusion. Everything about Islam was so ugly, so grotesque, in the most uncreative, rigid, dry, and austere interpretation of the religion. Or at least everything about Islam that I saw, or that I was experiencing, or that is presented to us as the mainstream today. A religion of beards, robes, demands, hysteria, and the force of authority. The Islam I was born into was on the surface level an Islam of men. There was no frosting, nothing that invited curiosity to swipe a finger into the deliciousness. The Islam I was to later find, Allah's Islam, was a feminine faith rich with mystery and duality. A religion born in the heart of darkness, in the womb of a cave. What could a man know about the feminine and her mysteries? What does a man know about the womb? What does a man know about the dark mother? What does a man know about practicing secretly your religion in a cave? The irony is, that all the authority in Islam had been given to beards and robes when it was only initially given to a man as a placeholder until women rose from the earth we've been buried into. Men are not guardians, but custodians of a faith that has increasingly, bis increasingly been misunderstood and spoiled. What comes to your mind when you think of Islam? It's an important question to hold because as you go through the pages to follow and the books to follow, you know, it's from what I've seen, at least from those who have read it and who've loved what they read, there is such um, a shattering of the old identity of Islam, what we know of as Islam versus what is being offered in the, in the telling of the story to come. 
for non-Muslims, the first honest image that would come to mind for most people, even those who were tolerant and indifferent to politics, would, would be um, an angry, bearded villager in mid-scream. And, you know, you think of that image of a mid-scream. What does it look like when someone is screaming, their mouth is open? In, in an artistic representation, it's like a black hole, right? Like it's nothingness coming out. And that is such a contrast to what I offer through my Substack, for example, which is the diving into the rabbit hole, which has been my journey, which is a diving into the dark, into, into the mystery, into the unknown. And so you have these two contrasts. You have you know, the language of the heart, you have the language of God, you have the imagery of God, which is inviting, which is exploratory. Then you've got this representation of what I call the distortion, which is the symbol is the same. You've got this dark hole, but in one case you're going into it. And in another case of a mid scream, you've got this dark hole and you've got this like chaos coming out of it. So that idea of symbolic language that is held in sort of a two sides of a coin analogy is very rich throughout the entire songbook series. The image of an angry, bearded villager in mid-scream. It is a wildly accurate imagining of what has been done to Islam, a religion characterized by rage and confusion between all the different personalities assigned to it between being a religion of peace and being a religion of war. For most Muslims, the answer to the same question would be something like a perfect order. They see Islam as a religion of symmetry. That isn't Islam. The pristine order you imagine is a forced, fixed, and steadfast thing. What you're thinking of is a masculine presence like the characteristics of the sun that many ancient faiths believed in, always in the light, always illuminated. That isn't Islam. Both groups measure faith by the same figure, the length of a beard or a robe, the pitch of the scream, the dilation of the pupil as it expresses its glare of discontent, the vastness of faith is so great it could only be held by an expanse like the void. It could only be held by an expanse like the void. The vastness can't be measured, let alone be measured by an eye that has never left the perimeter of the village. The eye that sees order and compliance as safety. The eye that cannot see that just beyond the walls is a wilderness that is rich with God and thick with the sacred. Islam is like the moon in a time lapse of the night sky across a month, changing faces and forms as it spirals and curves in the pattern of infinity. This is the face Muslims have been turning to for 1400 years to map their relationship with God. Allah is not a moon goddess or a moon god, but Allah is like the changing face of God dancing across a black diamond sea. The changing face of God dancing across a black diamond sea. But you don't see that if you stay with the story of the illusion that Islam is captured by the meme of the village or the village idiot, or is some perfect masculinized order that isn't part of the natural world that the heart of Islam is found and nestled in. It's not bigotry to silently confess we have questions or doubts or even assumptions. That's the start of a much needed conversation that helps us move out of the gridlock. We have only gotten more ensnared in since the start of the 21st century. The Islam of illusion is all I saw for years. I saw an identity that festered the heart of our wilderness into a sanitized system devoid of passion unless that passion was rage. That's what I found in the surface layer story of Islam, a story that was being mirrored 
in American society since 2016. At points, I was at the edge of leaving Islam, as most of us have said we would do if the current events swung in one direction or another. We leave or we start thinking about leaving, whether that's a religion or party, a state or country. There is already a mass exodus in place that's beyond religion, but the story of religion can help inform these patterns since religion has been in a migration pattern for thousands of years. Still, something tugged at me. I, instead of settling or instead of setting the religion on fire, instead of blaming the religion or its cursed culprits, I set fire to myself. I had already set a match to everything that didn't feel like it belonged in the bonfire of my being. When we look for discovery or for purpose, we tend to look outside of ourselves, beyond ourselves. It is now with the gift of hindsight that I can see that I was the purpose. I was the answer to my questions. I was what I needed to find. I was looking outside myself, but if I could have seen myself set ablaze, I would have seen starlight being born out of the plumes of fire, the rising of a phoenix, singing the song of death and rebirth, one star of many across a dark night sky, mapping a constellation of lives born to this time to be in service to the sacred. Yet, at the time, I could barely write a sentence with any self-reference. It was hard for me to start a sentence with I. It still sometimes is. I was in my early 20s and soon clawing at the surface of questions around faith, identity, and belonging that have since become the cornerstone of my work. I didn't have the depth of experience to know how to master curiosity or how to wander through such a provocative and sensitive topic, let alone weave in critical self-reflection. If I couldn't navigate this landscape with Karen presence, I couldn't tell some story about it that was worth listening to. And this is an important story to get right. We've seen in the last 20 years what happens when people project their wounds and reactions at others without doing their inner work first. The rising tide of extremism is an expression of unhealed, wounding hurled as rage upon the world. For all the missed opportunities and subsequent string of career failures, and there have been many, I am grateful I had the sense to hold off on writing this book until I mastered the wisdom of timing, until I healed the wounds within. And, you know, if I can interject, I would say that, especially it's been, I published this work in March, and it's been March, April, May, June, July, August, it's been six months, and I feel like I've been um, displaced, dislodged, perhaps even exiled from the old community that I was part of, and that I don't belong there anymore. And all the opportunities are gone ever since I shared the story of identity politics, and the opportunities aren't there. I can try as hard as I can to get placed, to get op-eds out there, to, you know, to do whatever I would do that got me in a position uh, that many of you know me for, but now it's like hitting a brick wall every single time. And it's been a challenge, but it's also been a learning experience in that would I change it? Would I go back and maximize the platform and the intention that I had at the time, the opportunities that I had, if I didn't yet have the story right or the song right versus getting it right, presenting it, and at least in terms of the old um, circles that I was in, having it not resonate whatsoever. So basically, would I rather be successful as someone who was, uh, I guess you could say, half-witted or half-aware at the time, or would I rather be more aware, but <laughs> largely a failure? I, I would say I would rather stay where I am today because it's so important uh, to get it right. it's I can't stress that enough. And I see that as a growing problem more and more in our culture where, you know, you just, you just fling or you flick whatever thought or expression or wound you have and you think that makes a platform. And it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't. And other than it harming the dialogue, it harming the discourse, it being more of a regressive 
factor in culture. It's just, it shortchanges who you are first and foremost as a person. It's a complete disadvantage to the depth and capacity of the song that is within us if we just um, rush into uh, the opportunities that are before us because simply because they exist. This work isn't about me so much as I use my experience to tell a bigger story. The story of the dark feminine in Islam pivots around some of the greatest generational questions of our time. Questions like, what place does faith have in a 21st century human world? If religion continues to be weaponized, do we remove religion from human consciousness? Or is there still a role religion can play? Is there some other way to play with religion? Is religion something we need to start playing with instead of worshipping? Or is play a form of worship? Can play be worship? Or worship as play? What is worship? What does it mean to play? These and a hundred other questions like it are what seeded a garden of curiosity over the last 22 years before the eventual birth of this book. The Song of the Human Heart, Dawn of the Dark Feminine in Islam, was years in the making. It has been in the making all my life, really, but my ability to begin seeing what was being knit out of my life, that seeing was only possible when I saw my own being as possible, in a way that broke through every ceiling and foundation I was told our human identity was predicated on. This book is a collection of field notes, reflections, and revelations on what becomes possible in us, when we are awakened. In my case, how did one unanswered question about Islam after 9-11 become a loose thread and how that loose thread unraveled the illusion of God, faith, and our place in the realm of creation? When I look back on this path as an outsider, I see what a gift this journey has been. How did a 20-year-old, puzzled by the question, quote-unquote, what do you believe, or what do Muslims believe, turn into a 42-year-old who went through one of the most taboo doors in Islam, the quote-unquote satanic verses, the most contested passage in the Quran in which Prophet Muhammad allegedly acknowledged three pagan goddesses. No, Allah is not a pagan god, though God's own identity and evolution through a human eye is complex and unstable. Further, not even the pagans of the time intended for their three goddesses to accompany or supplement the prime divinity that is God. There is more beneath the surface about this crowning seal of monotheistic tradition. Islam recognizes and honors the divine feminine. It always intended to. Prophet Muhammad's earliest revelations sing of the sacred feminine. The sacred feminine weaves through and beyond time, found in the earliest pagan religions, which Islam did borrow from and speak to in the Quran repeatedly. She is Holy Spirit, dark mother of unseen world, singing between the world of form. She is the feminine aspect of God, enshrined in the tradition of the goddess. She is in the cavity of the heart, the womb of life, the cave of revelation. She is sanctuary. She is of the primordial void before creation. She is of earth and of stars, reverent and holy. She is ethereal life, the dark matter between all life, the black Madonna. She is the dark. She is beautiful. She is alive of a week. It takes the chaos of the dark goddess to set this truth free in the hearts of women to help us remember our human divinity. The dark goddess as the mythological representation of the highest feminine consciousness or the dark goddess as an archetype. 
the dark, has been home to women long before Islam. And she returns again here through Islam. The dark is the other eye of God alongside the light across a face that is nebulous and unknowable in our infancy as humanity. The expression of the sacred feminine is infused in this work through its tenderness and through its creativity and dissolution of traditional boundaries we set up around a religion. I see Judaism, for example, as the foundation of monotheism, Christianity as its heart, and Islam as its crowning. All three stem from something which knows God by an older name, the anima mundi, the soul of the world. At some points, I explore the question of Islam within the subset of its own identity. At other times, I look at how this faith relates to people outside of its label. But the heart of my work is a devotion to how the root touches the crown. In his book, The Prophet, Khalil Gibran wrote, The erect and the fallen are but one man standing in the twilight between the night of his pygmy self and the day of his god self and that the cornerstone of the temple is not higher than the lowest stone in its foundation. In his passage, Gibran speaks to justice, but for me, it always spoke of faith. What is faith without justice? What justice is possible when what is of the dark remains in the dark? The pygmy hidden in the lowest stone forgotten. What is the temple without all parts in balance, including the crown, the star atop the tree of life, the crescent rising above the minaret. The crown is no better or worse than any other part of the vessel. It is part of the full, complete expression of the vessel. The crown is not an entitlement or a birthright because you happen to be born in that expression or into that religion. It has to be activated. A crown is a spiritual completion, an adornment that completes the transformation. Without completion and full integration of all parts, there is no crown. This book is an invocation for our crowning. It is an invitation to shed the belief that we are born into a complete faith. We are born free, and most of us are placed within a belief system. But no matter which religion we are placed into, Faith is a dance with the divine that we are here to remember and invoke. We are moving belly against the ground, skin raw, slithering in a divine dance that is the frequency of life forever in movement towards source, to the wellspring of love, toward union of all parts. In Hindu and Buddhist traditions, energy centers in the body known as chakras work as a series of wheels within the wheelhouse of the human vessel. In Hindu and Buddhist traditions, energy centers in the body, known as chakras, work as a series of wheels within the wheelhouse of the human vessel. The three branches of monotheism are chakra points within the collective human consciousness. If one chakra or energy point is blocked, the vessel loses its balance. When the crown chakra is out of alignment, it blocks a body's willingness to be open to other ideas and forms of knowledge. When the crown chakra is blocked, the tradition recommends savasana, the corpse pose. When something feels it is of death, dying, or has lost what makes it feel alive and pulsing with the vibration of the heart, as Islam has been for me the last 22 years, then the course wasn't to bring death back to life as some animated corpse or to pander to the fantasy of Islam being a quote-unquote death cult. The path was to go into the shadows, into the depth of its darkness and be comfortable with it, skilled in understanding the death around it, and come back to the world through the wisdom of the underworld. The dark creates a new spiritual arc of human belonging. Much of this came to me through experience, dreams, waves of channeling that began on my 40th birthday, cracking open a budding gift of the mystic, as well as two psilocybin or plant medicine experiences that deepened the lens by stripping the veil between worlds. 
The sacred feminine in the tradition of my foremothers is the watering hole I drink from. Through these series of books, we return to Islam, to that which saw the feminine as a healing gift in the world. The traditions of the divine feminine through the dark create a new arc in the story of Islam and in the story of all of us. It offers restoration and a completion of the story of faith. The story of Islam was porous with more questions than, than there were answers. The lack of answers didn't diminish my faith, they strengthened it. If Islam was a kitchen pot, it was a colander. If Islam was a field in space, it had way too many wormholes. At every turn of exploring the faith through readings, personal studies, inner faith immersions, courses, conversations, and more, I only found more questions. The more questions I had, the more curious I became, and the deeper and more patient my eyes grew. The answer ultimately wasn't in any course or book. The answer is within the song that is calling to us always through the story of our lives. What I learned over the years is that Islam is no more in a silo than it is a flat monolith. Theologically, Islam created channels for navigating religious landscapes, including legal codes called Sharia, that are intended as channels of waters that can be crossed as it best suits the needs of a time and its people. Historically, as it stands today, despite the Arabization of the religion, Islam would be practiced distinctly. It is a divergent faith, like water that reaches out following the patterns and cracks in the ground that give it the most natural, most organic way to nestle into new spaces, while it continues to reach and spread into new edges toward what is always a frontier from the perspective of that stream. The practice of Islam deviated from community to, to community. This was normalized um, this was a normalized practice that many of us have tried to communicate to Western audiences. We've long held since September 11th, 2001, that Islam is not a homogenous religion, like the iconic monolith of the film 2001, A Space Odyssey. Islam is one pillar in the temple of God that contains within it an entire universe of independent realities. What I found is that our understanding of faith is deepened by all the other aspects of our lives. In other words, we need to break down the silos. We need to tear down the walls that turn the map of our human experience into an identity grid. Each piece of who we are is imprisoned within the walls of one identity box. By doing this, we expand the field we call home into a much broader plane that includes what is known with what is unknown. Now we can begin to venture beyond the self-imposed perimeter, go beyond the wilderness of God, and come back to the ghost of our old selves with greater reverence for the story of the divine hands of God our entire life was trying to tell us. You don't need to fight the religion or its deviance. You don't need to preach or change anything beyond your own being. You look for what changes in you, that is the song you sing. Your duty in faith, if you accept it, is to find your song and sing it unashamedly. The work is you, us. When we change, religion will change. Islam will move out of being a religion and toward being an orientation. We have practiced for this moment our entire lives. Each time we pray, we practice repatterning our minds, our hearts, our bodies towards a new orientation. In between every prayer, there is an ever-present azan, a call to prayer, singing to us the song of God, calling us home. In the late 2000s, historian and president of the Middle East Forum, Daniel Pipes, read one of the earlier and evolving drafts of this book. He had one recommendation. Don't be an autodidact. After going home and looking up what autodidact meant, I took his advice and enriched my repertoire to gain a wider understanding of a question many fine people have contributed toward understanding for centuries, along with what has been offered by others outside of Islam. I studied with Sheikh Uthman Khan of Critical Loyalty, taking classes on Islamic theology and history on Sundays. I took another wonderful set of classes with Omid Safi, a Sufi and an Iranian-American professor of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Duke University. On Twitter recently, Omid asked a question on faith, suggesting that, quote, the real question 
to ask is not do we need less faith or more faith, but what kind of faith? Remember, the pharaoh had a religion and the slaves had a religion. The African human being stolen had a religion. And the slave's master waiting for them had a religion. Unquote. Safi's words are particularly relevant given that the secular world has segregated itself from faith, failing to understand it and growing into the practice of mocking faith keepers. They don't see that the patterns of extremism and cults that grew from distorted and oppressive ideologies are not exclusive to one religion or the other. They are part of a belief system and are surging across secularism and the cult of progress no differently than any other than any other ideology within the web of a distorted heart. When I look at this question, I see the answer to why mastering the generational crisis of Islamic extremism is so important. The problem isn't religion so much as that it's broken patterning of the human mind and behavior, or what I call the curse. The curse is not a curse exclusive to Islam or any other religion. The curse is encoded into the grids we keep propelled and in working order within the system we call civilization. I also learned from the questions other had, others had about this question of Islam, most of which carousel around a genuine curiosity on whether a 1,400-year-old faith had wiggle room. If so, what would be a sound and respectful theological approach that could move the needle or give us more space? From an editor at the University of Virginia's The Hedgehog Review to political commentator Alan Combs, may his memory be a blessing, to keynote speakers and feminist literary conferences, each of these individuals' interests in the query reflected a profound desire to understand the complexity of a question that, at least at the time, wasn't being catered to in the broader media. And while there is greater awareness that Muslims are a diverse group, there is an increasingly reductive narrative of the question of Islam. We cover the question with platitudes like Islam is peace or that all Muslims are peaceful and so on, but the truth is more colorful than that. Another salient piece of advice on how to approach this work came from Eugene Kane, a longtime colonist for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. May his memory also be a blessing. Kane, who I befriended, in the late 2000s, quickly became a supporter of the message of inquiry. Early on, he strongly advised me to be more open about myself and to speak more from my experience. In 2005, after reading another draft of the premise of, for this work, Kane wrote, quote, in very simple terms, I think the story has to include more personal observation instead of dry recitation of facts or history or even footnotes. I know you've done the research. And maybe you want to produce a scholarly work as opposed to a bestseller, but as your honorary agent, ahem, allow me to drop this out of the box, box suggestion for you. The winner of the National Book Award for nonfiction this year was Tanehisi Coates, an African American writer in the tradition of James Baldwin, my hero, who basically wrote a letter to his son about racism and brutality about against black people during the past few years that gave birth to the Black Lives Matter movement. Everything he wrote about has been said before, but he caught the eye of critics because he had a fresh angle, explaining how he got into this racial mess to his young son. I think a nonfiction book by a talented Muslim writer and mother who was concerned about what kind of world her young son will inherit in terms of his Muslim um, identity would be something I'd buy off the shelves, particularly if it was also betrayed by the background and history and analysis you're already planning to include. But the most valuable part would be the personal stuff. What do you want Reagan to know about? His background as a Muslim American, what needs to change or be learned in order to, uh, for his generation to take the next step? That's my immediate reaction. I know you're serious about this project, so I have no problem giving you my opinion because before it's done, I'm sure the book will have several different stages and evolutions. That's what makes writing serious stuff so rewarding. Again, you have the knowledge and the perspective. I'd add, the personal stuff to your story to allow it to stand out from the rest. Good luck and have fun. It was the best advice I could have gotten. But it was also, it would be another seven years before I knew what Eugene was talking about. I had no frame of reference to understand in any tangible sense what it meant to write personally. I was light years away from understanding how to have fun or how important having fun actually is to the whole discovery of self 
and story as a component of faith, I hadn't yet fully descended into the human story beneath the story of identity and religion, race and nationality. It will be one of my deep regrets in life that I can't pick up the phone and call Eugene to thank him. That ship has sailed. And I sense that the window for this book is also closing. The timing feels quite immediate, as if I already feel everything and know everything I need as part of the curriculum for this calling. I've been wandering in the desert my whole life, lost because I didn't know how to read a map. I didn't know the map wasn't a flat work, but a multidimensional orb that is one human reality. I dedicated myself to this book in the winter of 2022 in rhythm with the natural cycle of descent in the world into the dark to emerge again into the light. There was also the question of whether it be wise to spend time going back and forth trying to secure a publisher. Finding a willing publisher and going through the publishing process is a lengthy phase, though ideal for mass distribution. Fortunately, I had author Paul Bradley Carr's advice. In a webinar with Chairman Me, a woman-led networking platform founded by Sarah Lacey Carr, uh, advised self-publishing if the message was time-sensitive, which it is, and two, if I already had an existing platform, which I do, kind of. Despite being someone with a very poor sense of time, through the time blindness that comes with autism and ADHD, there is another kind of time that is always concurrent with our clocks and calendars. Whether you're intuitive or not, there is a growing sense that we're on the clock in a wave we've never been before. Many sense that the United States and much of the world with it is going to radically shift in the near future. I've always sensed that the message this book offers needed to be out there and accessible before that happened. I don't know the scale of impact this work will have, what kind of wave it will create, or when, or even if at all, beyond just a handful of people. But that is faith. That you move forward without needing to have all the parts of the plan. There is a secret conversation between you and God that no other man or thing knows of. That's the faith you go into the quest with. And along the way, you're melded to it. You're indistinguishable from the faith. You become like the drop of water in the ocean, in the ocean and of it. Impossible to separate and impossible to become separated from the element that is the foundation of God's throne the way of water. That is when your faith and its mysteries begin to blossom open for you without pause or retreat. The wellspring of unfolding layers and depths of how God's hidden hand is ever spinning a beautiful song where all the parts are only and could only be alive in the mystery that is uniquely your life. It's the most ecstatic love affair. We measure and weigh faith like a careful accountant, ever watchful of the sliding scale of life in a transaction rather than what it is. An ecstatic dance, a splendid love, a glorious wonder, a beautiful grace, passionate and full of abandon, innocent and artful. And also terribly frightening because there is an element of unknown and an element of surrender, which is always hard for us for at least most of us. This must be the intoxication Sufism, Islam's mystical branch, speaks of. You emerge from this whirlwind dance, entranced by the mysteries, a labyrinth meant for the wandering and getting lost. To know the mysteries is to dance with wonder. You slip into another dimension, another reality, a different space within the space you were already in. A reality within a reality, like a mirror world. When you come out of it, you wipe the corner of your mouth with your thumb and your eyes scan the room slowly to reground yourself in this one known version of reality. Being able to talk about Islam, a woman's perspective, motherhood, extremism, and imagination puts you in a very rare niche. There is an exceptional band of people who have stayed with the ride, so to speak. Thank you. From there, or from here, I imagine, the nature of the unique magic that is this perspective and the story will draw others. That is faith. My story as an immigrant from a very young age, as a Muslim, as a daughter, and as a mother, my work within extremism and more, all tell an interconnected story. Over the years, I was repeatedly asked and advised by some to just focus on one niche, 
be it women's rights, extremism, Islam, autism, or childhood. Even those closest to me often question why I didn't make a career as a pundit or influencer within Islam, while also not walking away from it. This book is why I was searching for something I didn't yet have a framework around, but I knew it was there somewhere in the fog of my own being. I didn't have an expiration date or a deadline on when that would arrive, but as of July 2022, the pieces of the puzzle finally started locking into place. None of these themes are unique to me, but their patchwork is. They're unique in how I experience them and how I braid them together. What is unique to my signature is in how I bring these elements together and how I use my experience and gifts to map another way into a secret garden. My contribution to the question of what is the meaning of life is a song. The answer is a song. Faith is the pathway to developing the full ear to be able to listen and hear the song. The song of the human heart is a song of the heart, not an analysis of the heart, not a report, nor accounting or history and mind, and certainly not a debate or a calculation. A song, a song is a full expression and emotion is the universal language of the heart when in authenticity when it is expressed as a response and not a reaction. There is an intimacy in framing the conversation on faith and belonging in this way that I think gets lost when we approach it through only the disciplines and sometimes the delusions of the mind. The stories that follow are offered in intimacy as if you and I were sitting by the fire under the cloak of night, lips red stained with drink, cheeks flushed by the warmth of fire, and beautiful storied eyes widening, sinking into a more primal way of being, resting into the story of what it means to be human. Parts of the story also enrich a sensory experience by recommending which songs to pair with the reading. The recommended songs are featured in order in my Spotify playlist. The playlist is named by each respective book. So this playlist for this book would be called The Song of the Human Heart. The Song of the Human Heart, Dawn of the Dark Feminine in Islam, is the first of a series of songbooks encompassing a volume of dark Islam that will continue to be built upon. The answer to all the questions I had about faith were in the realm of the weird quantum universe where anything and everything is possible all at once. So many varied experiences colored in a portrait of Islam given the faith of richness or giving the faith a richness I could never have extracted from any conventional study through courses or teachers or books. The more complexities I encountered, the more I also noticed patterns that cross the boundaries of disciplines and identities all creating one vast map of human journey. At heart, I've always been a wanderer. I honor the migration that journeys from place to place, not seeking arrival, but finding arrival through wandering, like a song. The map is like a song, always moving. We are also like a song, always moving, always flowing through a rabbit hole of faith. The rabbit hole is a wormhole piercing in and out of the world like a moon threading infinity across the sky. The map isn't a field or a picture or anything static that can be pinned and tracked neatly. The map is the mastery of chaos in motion. A masterful world orchestrated by a masterful God and a distinctly female nature of the world of creation. A rediscovery of the sacred feminine in Islam and what it can offer humanity at this hour isn't something that can be understood through one vein. At least it wasn't for me. The Quran alone, for example, is a curiosity cabinet, a Narnia-like wardrobe you walk into and beyond. Islam is something you experience, a faith birthed in the womb of a cave, in one song in the chorus of all creation. Islam is one language, one tongue, like a great ore tasting the waters of the divine. Islam, in the tradition of the sacred feminine, is one gateway to God. The God Gateway is a birth canal, and its name is the Dark Night of the Soul. The rivers of the canal carry the waters of life upon which death hoists sail between worlds. The price to journey with her is the depths of your vulnerability.
If you enjoyed this podcast, I invite you to subscribe, like, and leave a review. You're also welcome to share it with your community and keep up with updates on future episodes. For more on my work, you can visit shereenkadosi.com. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to your next visit.